Okay. And we are on. We are on the air. Awesome. Oh, so hello there to Allison Bork. Hi, how's it going? Going great. From somewhere in Sunset, Louisiana. Yes. What yes. time is it in Sunset, Louisiana? It's kind of a, you're going to tell me it's morning in Sunset. Yes. So it's nine o'clock a.m. in Sunset, Louisiana, and it's probably almost 95 degrees over here already. Wow. Um, and I'm over here in Israel where it is almost sunset, really. Oh, that's right. That's right. So what kind it's of weather are y'all having over there? We're having very nice uh, spring weather. Uh, not hot and humid yet, but it will be. In the mm -hmm. summer, our weather is like Louisiana. Um, and I've been there. So, um, Allison, we're, we're not here to talk about the weather. Um, I'm here with the wonderful author, Alison Bork, uh, to talk about her fifth book in the Alley Cat series. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention it, and you'll correct my pronunciation. Alley and the Catty Wampus Wednesday. Yes, it's Alley Cat and the Catty Wampus Wednesday. And it came out just three or four days ago. Yes, it came out on Monday. And this is the fifth book in the Alley Cat series. So I'm super excited. I can't wait to celebrate. We're going to have a book launch party on Saturday. And it's just been a week of celebrations. That's incredible. So I'm here to celebrate uh, with you. Um, so I'm just going to mention that I'm Mel Rosenberg for the New Books Network, the children's literature channel. And how wonderful to have you on the show. So Allison, um, it's about you and your life and about your craft and your book. Let, let's start with a few words about the series and your you book. So the series started back in 2016. I, I have a background in teaching. I also practice law for almost eight years. And when I was practicing law, I decided to take a year off and be at home with my kids who were young at the time. And so while doing that, I would always read them stories at night. Both my husband and I, we always do bedtime stories. And so they have books, as most kids, they have books all over their floor. You know, they're not in the bookshelf and they wanted more books. They wanted me to buy them more books. And um, I just simply told them, hey, how about I just write you a story? And they jumped up and down. They believed in me and they were so excited and thrilled that it, it was my aha moment. It was that moment where I felt like if they believe in me at, at six and four, then I should be believing in myself. And so but, but hold on, Allison, this, this is, you know, there's millions, I dare say tens of millions of parents who make up stories for their children, mm -hmm. but there's only one or two out of 5,000 writers that actually become published, let alone have a series and a successful one. And you've been featured all over the world. So um, let's, uh, let's concentrate on the book. And then I want to take you back to your childhood. Um, so, um, a few words about the new book. Okay. So the new book, Alley Cat and the Catty Wampus Wednesday. So I wrote this book during the pandemic, you know, writing is a form of therapy for me. And, you know, when we were in the pandemic, nobody knew what the next day would bring. We were all kind of just almost insecure of what to expect and everything seemed out of reach and we didn't know what to do. And so everything was kind of cattywampus. And so uh, I said, well, you know what? If I'm feeling this way, then my readers who read these books are feeling this way too, likely. So I need to give them a tool and a resource to help them cope with this cattywampus world. But of course, I didn't want to write a book about the pandemic because, you know, who wants to read about that? So I wrote a book about a day in Alley Cat's life where she goes through each and every moment and it's backwards and and wacky and you know there's she's eating seafood gumbo for breakfast and people are spelling words backwards and she has to rely on her friends and her family those things that are constant in our, our lives to get through the day and also maintain a positive attitude and you can see that when she does maintain this kind of go with the flow take it one step at a time attitude Things just, she shines brightly by doing that. And so um, it's a way for my readers to be able to 
to get through any kind of cattywampus day, whether it's a pandemic or maybe just a bad day at school and, and know that you can rely on those things that are constant, our family, our friends, a positive attitude always helps in a situation that seems a little bit wacky. And so um, that's why I wrote the book. And I hope that readers can use it as a tool to get through any, any sort of day that they might have. Wonderful. Um, and it's a good time now to mention the illustrator and the publisher. Yes. So my illustrator is Chiara Savati. She's from Italy. Um, she's been with me since the beginning of the series. Uh, she's just wonderful. We work so well together. And I will sketch certain things. And I'm not a real, I'm not a good illustrator, but she is fantastic. So I'll sketch things. I'll send her pictures and then she will just perfect it. And I approve everything along the way with her help. I give her a lot of creative control too. Uh, so we work really well together. My publisher is Pelican Publishing. They are an imprint of Arcadia Publishing. They have taken on the entire series and um, they're just wonderful. It's very uh, rare that the writer actually works so closely with the illustrator. Yeah. Any, so, any comment about that? So Kiara is, she's just really creative. And so I, I want to be able to give her some input and some creative control. And um, I mean, we work so well together. My kids feel like she's part of the family. And if she ever comes to the U.S., we're going to just have to meet up because she is part of the Alley Cat family. And she's she's just wonderful. She, she lives in Italy on the Lago de Como. Yes. Have yeah. you been there? No, I have not. I've been to Italy. Uh -huh. um, I've been to the Alley Capri. Yeah. I just you, you, you have to go there. Don't invite her to Louisiana. I tell know. Her, I need tell to her go that there. you're coming. <laughs> it's one of the it's most. True. It's gorgeous. Um. So, but you know, most writers, they don't see the artwork. They, they see a finished version and you have this uh, wonderful prerogative as an author of working together with the illustrator. Um, now let's say, uh, let's, um, it, it's a good time now to show a couple of spreads if you want to. Sure. Your four day old book. I know. I love this spread. So my kids love this spread because the cats are in PE class and they love the coach. They think the coach is so funny. And you can see on this spread, there's the hopscotch. And normally your hopscotch starts with one and then it goes on, but you know everything's kind of wonky and wacky in this book. And so it starts with 10. And the great thing is I love to hide Easter eggs in all of my books. Those are literary Easter eggs that readers can find. And so the number one is pink because that was the first book in the series. And number two is blue. That was Monday Blues. Three, Friendship Friday. Four, Tournament Tuesday. And five, of course, this book. And so throughout the book, you can see, I love this spread too. I love them all. <laughs> Louisiana. Well, actually it's spelled right because we're flipped on your camera on, on Facebook, but normally it's, it's backwards. The popcorn popsicles are here on the, um, on the little shelf. And that's from the first book, Alley Cat and the Thursday Dessert Day. So just little Easter eggs that readers can find. They love looking at it like a scavenger hunt throughout the book. That's, uh, that's incredible. Uh, now, Allison, I want to take you back to your childhood. Where were you born and what were you like as a, uh, as a five-year-old kid? So I was born in um, Milton, Louisiana, which is right outside of Lafayette, Louisiana. And I was born and raised there. And um, at five years, I, I have a twin sister and I have two brothers. So, you know, there was a lot of us and we were always just playing and imagining things. And just, um, you know, we had this big giant tree house that we would come up with stories and be creative and um, such a great childhood. Um, a little background that's kind of interwoven with the Alley Cat series that whenever I was probably in second grade, I would always imagine stories and I would like use my fingers as like people as, as kids do. And in class, I would always daydream and start imagining stories. I was a really good student and I would catch on to things and then I would start daydreaming. And so one of my teachers, she would go, she would snap her fingers and she'd say, Alley Cat, come back down to earth 
because she could tell I'm like daydreaming and, you know, thinking of stories. And so for me, when I started the book series, that was Alley Cat. Alley Cat is someone who is imaginative, creative, kind of lost in her own creative world and, um, and coming up with just all this, you know, in all my stories, it was always like a problem solving skill that was there. And so that's why I named the character Alley Cat because of my teacher in second grade. Your teacher came up with this nickname? Yes. And it was a nickname for me when she was trying to be real sweet, you know, instead of being like, Allison, stop daydreaming. She would just Alley Cat come back down to earth. So, um, so yeah, yeah. That, that's how it kind of came up. And Sometimes people call me Alley Cat now. So I asked you at the age of five, but I'm wondering now, uh, what is the exact age that you target these Alley Cat books? So it's usually about um, ages, we say three to eight. Um, The story is a little longer than an average picture book. It's um, not too long, but it does um, have a lot of like descriptive text. And being a, a past teacher, I wanted to include words that were a little bit bigger um, so that kids can learn them, uh, like cattywampus. And so I um, sometimes I'll say it's more of like six to eight, but of course they can be read um, to any age. You know, as parents, we can read them to our kids at night or you know, librarians can read them to any age. Okay. And um, do you feel that when you're writing these stories, you morph back into a Mm -hmm. six-year-old? Or are you trying to fix things when you you were six? Or are you trying to recreate a wonderful childhood? Where are you in the six-year-old story? So, you know, at six years old, we would, of course, we'd play outside and we'd play in our tree house, but we'd also watch things like Fraggle Rock. I don't know if you remember Fraggle Rock and um, like the Muppets, like the Muppet Babies and Bugs Bunny. Um, and so all of those things stick with you along the way. And um, so when I channel my inner, you know, five, six year old, to write these books, I channel that. And I think about the things that resonated with me when I was that age and what stuck with me. And so I want to incorporate it into my books, but I also have two young kids. Uh, well, they're now 13 and 11, but when I started the series, they were young. And so when they would come home from school and they'd have these, these, maybe these issues that are not that big issues, but to them, they're big. I would always try to think, how can they solve these problems themselves, not just kind of be upset and just kind of stuck in that upset moment. And so um, I channel that how to problem solve. That's, you know, the teacher in me also. And then at the time, my kids were watching a lot of Max and Ruby and all of these Nickelodeon shows. And I would really zone in on the lessons and the morals, the ones that stuck with them and made an impact. And so there's a lot of different factors that come into play when I'm writing these stories. Um, And another inspiration is my own pets at home because I have two cats and a dog and they're always doing something really crazy. And I'm surprised they're not on top of my chair right now. Uh, But yeah, it's just getting inspiration from my own childhood, my kids, my pets, and also the students that I visit at author visits at schools. You know, I get to watch them and and interact with them. And they always have all of these suggestions for like my next stories too. Wonderful. When you were a teacher, what age uh, did you teach? It was first grade. So that was probably about six, seven years old. So you're really focused on this particular age. Yes. And so when I taught school, when I would read books to the kids in class, they would never want the story to end if it was a good book. And so when I wrote these books, I wanted the story not to end for them. So I have activities at the end of each book, you know, whether it's a recipe or a song or a dance, something they can bring with them and keep going with this story. Because when I read things like Harry Potter, I don't want it to end. You know, we all want stories to last forever. So I figure giving them these these activities, these supplemental materials at the end, that they can carry that forward too. 
Okay, but I, you know, uh, we, we teach uh, writers not to put the moral first. And of course, your story has morals, more than one, but they're not up front. Right. First of all, you have your plot. Um, so um, what I'm now curious about is the six-year-old Allison, who was a bit of a daydreamer and had a, a lovely childhood with a treehouse, mm. um, does not go into creative writing, but instead becomes a lawyer? <laughs> run, run me through that, please. So I, um, <laughs> this is sad to say, but as um, I guess like a teenager getting close to my 20s, I watched Legally Blonde, okay? And everybody thought Elle Woods was awesome. I mean, she was, and she had a little dog named Bruiser. Um, and I thought that was super cool. I thought it was empowering for women to be able to do things that maybe society doesn't think is as, you know, relevant for, for women to do. And so if there's a challenge that I see in life, I almost get into this OCD mode of accomplishing and, and removing that challenge and like diving right in. So for me, watching Legally Blonde and also seeing, you know, I had some family members that were attorneys. I thought, you know what, that looks super interesting. And I'm very analytical. I'm very type A. And this is not just a, a male career. I, I can do this and I can maybe make a difference. And so okay, this, I, this is, this is really interesting because I wasn't implying that at all. Um, and it's interesting. You will have to come back to this gender thing uh, because now it's interesting. No, but what I was saying is somebody who, who, um, who's a creative type, mm -hmm. you know, law is not necessarily considered a profession for very creative people who love uh, storytelling and writing. Well, I didn't realize that I was a creative. I did. I, I felt more like methodical in the way I was like, you know, I give me a trial brief and I'll come up with, you know, all of the, the facts and uh, the evidence. I didn't feel like a creative and um, because I didn't have like talents, like singing and, and drawing, I didn't have all of that, but I always loved to write. I would write poetry. I would, um, I would like to imagine. And it wasn't until that I took a year off of practicing law and had time to put pen and paper together as you know my kids suggested I did write them a story that's when I realized that I could easily do that like it wasn't hard for me to channel those thoughts and those stories onto paper and um and so then I realized yeah I can be creative and so it just took that to be able to you know okay so so you so you were writing all these years but it took your kids to realize that you could really do it. Right. But I wasn't writing children's books. I was writing trial briefs and uh, I've always written. No, yeah. as, as a kid, you didn't write. I would write poetry, a lot of poetry. poetry. I would do a lot of little cartoon drawings, like um, almost like graphic novels where it's just like a quick plot, um, something funny. And of course the drawings weren't great, but that's as far as I went with writing things down. Lots of poetry, but not, not so much um, writing children's stories. Okay, so a four-year-old and six-year-old at home asking mommy to write them stories, and you sit and write them stories, and then, and then what happened? So I, well, I wrote the first one, Alley Cat and the Thursday Dessert Day. I left the ending blank, and the next night I went upstairs, and we I read them the story. They loved it. And I left the ending blank. And so they had all these wild endings. You know, I had to kind of cut it back and um, I ended up finishing it. I typed it up into a Word document. I started querying, uh, well, researching how to get an agent or publisher. And then I started querying. I queried over 200 of them over the course of a year. I got 88 rejections. Um, that was tough. Um, makes you, you know, have a thick skin. And then I got a lot of no responses. And then when I started getting to a point where I'm like, I need to, I want to get back into practicing law. It's been almost a year. I was only going to do a temporary retirement. I got an email at 11 p.m. at night 
when I was almost like researching, like kind of like getting back into law, um, that I was accepted by a publisher. And so then it just a, took a, off a, from a there. A publisher or an agent? A publisher. So I started with Mascot Books, which is a hybrid publisher. And they picked up the first story and then subsequently picked up uh all four at the time, like four over the years. And then with this book, I am now picked up with Pelican Publishing, which is a traditional publisher. And they've picked up all five of the books I'm writing and we're in production for the sixth book. And so I'll start. What, yeah, wonderful. Just, so yeah. Allison, please run the readers by the difference between a, a, a traditional and a hybrid publisher. So a hybrid publisher is a publisher who they kind of work with you where I guess in a nutshell that you kind of have all the bulk copies printed. And so you're buying these copies to be sold, but you're not buying them at full price. So you're still able to like resell them. Um, it's the same as traditional. In most cases, I can only speak to my hybrid publisher, which uh, they're they were a great publisher and worked really well together um so one second so they don't pay you you pay them well i don't pay them i buy the i bought the inventory for okay the so, so all right yes so uh, i didn't all, pay all, them for any production or anything like that okay and so so you, so you buy um all of their books in stock some of the books in stock they also sell books Yes. Yeah, so they fulfill all of, they have an inventory just like Ingram, um, American Wholesale, and they actually supply with their stock, you know, Target, Barnes and Noble, libraries. Um, so it's a, it's a great, it's a great way to get started in publishing if you have the right hybrid publisher. Of course, with traditional. And, 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 and if you know how to sell all the books that you bought. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So how yeah. did you figure that out? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I do a lot of school author visits and I figured that was the best way to get the word out. Um, I love being in the school. You know, it reminds me of being a teacher. And so it's the best of both worlds. And so I think just, you know, by word of mouth and, and starting with the first book, people, um, you know, readers, they they started liking Alley Cat and so they want to know the next book and um, just word of mouth and and going and doing things like in the beginning I did so many things for free and just got involved in a lot of things you know from, and people really believed in me in the beginning and so I'm um, now I'm giving back to those who felt so I'll invite them to the book launch party and, 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 and say, here, promote your business, do whatever you can, because I want to give back to those who did so much for me. So this is all terrific. So what's now interesting is how you went from a scenario in which they published the books, but you had to buy books to a traditional publisher where they take on the whole, a, um, onus of making the books and selling the books. So how did you how did you transit from the hybrid publisher to a traditional publisher? So I I started the the querying process again and for each book and um that was with Caddy Wampus Wednesday and um Pelican liked it and picked it up and they've now picked up all the all the books and and more. So it's been a good transition. It, it was the goal all along to be traditionally published. Um, some people, it just takes a little bit longer. And um, Oh, Allison, don't get me wrong. You're one of many thousands of authors who have uh, succeeded. You know, it, an agent will get thousands of manuscripts a year and pick maybe two writers. To be rejected a hundred times is kind of par for the course. Mm -hmm. to, to have the career you have already is uh, is really outstanding. Well, thank you, thank you. It's um, uh, you, it's, you've done this. You've done this without an agent. Um, yeah, it's it's very difficult, and and a lot of people write books. I mean, you know, there's so many books out there, and it's discouraging at times. 
the competition. Um, but as long as I just keep pushing forward step by step, and trying to expand a little bit more and work really hard, you know, it just doors keep opening, which I think it's because I have that drive and that determination. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are days where I feel that it's really tough, you know? Um, One but- second, hold on. What do you do during those days? Because as writers, we all have more of those days sometimes than the other good days. What is your remedy? Ooh, um, with everything, whenever I feel overwhelmed, I'll write. I'll just put pen and paper and write. And what happens is I'm actually doing something that is um, still moving me forward, even though I'm in like this, you know, frustration. And it's just like when you're maybe frustrated with a a relationship, like a friendship or something. And if you write it down, you feel better, at least for a little bit. And so, um, you know, it it is tough. Any any business, even like any small business is is tough. There are going to be a lot of trials and tribulations. And but as long as you just keep moving forward, whether it's baby steps or, you know, taking some time to regroup. Um, you can persevere. Okay, that's that's wonderful news. Um, I, I would really like to ask you, could you read a little bit from the new book? Sure. Which, which I highly recommend. <laughs> so I um, I love this page. The but kids- you, 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 you like going against the norms. Mm-hmm. I noticed this about you. And I'm going to come back to this after you've read a little bit from the book. So this page, I'm not sure if you can see it, but Louisiana is spelled backwards. We're just flipped with the camera. And then, of course, like the Louisiana State slipped backwards. You see the Magnolia. So you know they're in Louisiana history class. So it says, after PE, the students headed to lunch, then to history class. Today, we'll be learning about Louisiana history, said Miss Purry. Who can tell me the state flower? Magnolia, shouted Spotty. Correct replied Miss Perry. Who can spell Louisiana for me? Luna answered quickly. A-N-A-I-S-I-U-O-L. What? Alley Cat thought. That's backwards. Very good, said Miss Perry. You're a great speller. (laughs) And when when I spell Louisiana backwards, and I'm reading it out loud to kids, they just laugh. They think it's so funny that she spelled it backwards and the teacher's like, great good job and they're like no and they it, when I do my author visits they they like freak out they're like no that's wrong miss allison <laughs> so. if if pelican is taking the books on then they are seeking a much wider distribution than louisiana yes they are so you know it's a you know it's a little tribute to where i'm from and um but they are definitely um they're definitely putting it in all of, you know, the Barnes and Nobles and, and indie bookstores, which I love and gift shops and um, yeah, worldwide. So, so now I want to come back to a little bit of the, of the, uh, of the writing. Your, your book works. It really works. It's, it's lovely to read and to enjoy. Um, but it goes against what we teach our students, which is generally not to use dreams Uh, as a conceit Um, and you've used the dream the whole story is a dream and yet it works and it works well yeah so you know I think some people some authors may disagree that sometimes my main character might get into a little bit of trouble she might kind of trick her brother in one story and then apologize and try to fix it. Or she might pout. Like in the first story, she pouts. She's upset. She missed out on dessert day. But like, what do our kids do? They pout. They get upset. They throw tantrums sometimes. That's normal. Sometimes we do as adults too. And that's that's just life. That's real. But what I want to do is I want to teach kids that even though you're having a rough day or something goes wrong, 
here are the tools to fix it. You have to give them that, that tool, that resource to be able to fix any of their problems because they're going to be adults one day and they're going to have a bad day and they might miss out on, you know, dessert, you know, at, at work, whenever they might have a meeting or uh, just anything or like friendship Friday, Alley Cat feels left out because there's a new student in class. And so a lot of people might say, well, you know, why is she kind of not self-absorbed, but why is she feeling left out when the new students knew? Well, everybody might feel left out that, you know, it's, I don't want it to be that predictable for kids. Mm -hmm. So you are essentially Alice and Alley Cat. <laughs> the more I get to know you now, I see more of you in the, uh, in the main character. Um, I want to ask you two more questions. Um, the first is, is uh, the um, aha moment. When you have the moment for a story, when you have like an idea, how does that happen? Do you have like a recipe for coming up with ideas for new stories, or is it just out of God knows where? It's usually when I'm somewhere and either my kids, my animals, or another, you know, kid, maybe an author visits doing something. And I always think how, how to fix that. I'm a, a fixer type of person. And so it's like, how to fix that? How, how do we make that better? And so I start thinking of ways to fix it. And then I'm like, what if, what if that didn't happen? What if it was like this and like just more, you know, elaborate, which a story would be. And so um, I usually, I used to write down a lot of things. I would take a, a notepad everywhere I go and I've gotten really busy. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't just stop. But when I do stop and I just kind of close my office door and take just a notepad, like a notebook and a pencil and start writing something comes up, it might be just a bunch of, you know, jumble. Um, but it always, it just kind of all these puzzle pieces just start coming together on paper. And, and I, I get really excited when it starts coming together. And I usually like, I run up to like my family. I'm like, look, look, what, look, look what I, I wrote. And, and they, they chime in with some different things that can happen. So it's, it's a, it's a great feeling to, to keep Alley Cat alive, you know, because that's, she's part of our family now. She's like a sibling to my kids. Absolutely. But is, are, are these predictable moments or unpredictable moments? Unpredictable moments. It's never planned. It's, you know, it's kind of how we live our life over here. It's just like, you know, living day by day. And you said a minute ago that uh, you're busy. So you're busy now full-time with your books. I'm, I'm busy with my books. I'm busy with my kids. I'm also busy with um, a PR firm that I have started with my business partner, Lori Erlinski. She and I, during the pandemic, um, we started a podcast to help authors still get out into the world. And so while doing that, long story short, authors started asking us for help with marketing. And so, um, and she's brilliant at marketing. She's got such a great background in um, marketing and she used to work for PBS. And um, so we decided to take on one author, which turned into over 200 authors and we helped launch their books. We helped revive their books. We helped market their books. And, you know, we both really love books so much and being a part of an author's journey. And so um, I have to balance my time with my own series and helping authors, my kids. It's a, a busy world, but I wouldn't have it any other way. That's wonderful. So these are authors who are publishing uh, independently, I guess. Uh, we have authors that are self-published, hybrid, and traditional authors. We even work with uh, publishers to help them with their marketing, too. So wow, that's incredible. We do a lot of think outside the box with marketing, um, especially in this virtual world that's moving more, you know, back into in-person. And so um, we just want to be uh, different. We want the authors to succeed and we love cheering them on. When they win an award, we're emailing them with a bunch of like emojis. We're so excited for them. 
Wonderful. So we'll have to sp speak about that another time, but it's, it's an intriguing subject. Um, and the last thing I'm going to ask you today is about this gender thing. Because, um, you know, I, I wanted to write children's books all my life, but I was relatively busy and I'm just getting around to it these days, shall we say, past five or 10 years. Um, and I'm surprised that there are so few guys writing children's books. This, this seems to be like, you know, you talked about um, legally blonde and, and penetrating a, a profession that's, that's considered male. Mm -hmm. My daughter, by the way, is an ace lawyer, so I don't think like that. But it, it, what, what's it with children's writing that there's so few guys? Do you have an answer for that? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think about my own husband and think whether he could write a children's book. And I'd probably say he probably couldn't. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe guys aren't as... Um, I don't know. Not, I don't want to say emotional, but they have a role, which is a great role to be steadfast and to be, you know, that, that person to lean on that's solid. And, you know, women can be that too, but maybe that's why uh, maybe they don't have as much time. I don't, I don't know. Um, we do have some authors that we help promote that are males writing children's books and they're great books. They really are. I think when males write children's books, they're very, very funny, like very comical um, because these are probably likely like dads who have kids and they're the ones that are wrestling on the ground with them or, you know, maybe they're just that personality that, you know, have a good sense of humor. Um, but they're always, when I see a, um, a children's book by a male, I love it. Like the, like the crayons book, when the crayons came home, that book cracks me up. And um, he wrote that so well. So they're always fun to read. Yeah, we have you know, a lot of really good books are written by guys, but when I go to meetings, conferences, I think Alice, in my interviews, you know, I don't discriminate uh, race, religion, or gender. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I've interviewed 95% of my interviewed authors, at least, are female. So um, we don't have to solve that right mm -hmm. away. Um, in, 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 yeah, in closing, I want to salute you for the humanity and humor and quirkiness in, uh, in your new book. And um, to wish you all the best with it and, and what you're doing to help other authors. I think as a community, we have to be there for one another because it is so difficult. Uh, difficult emotionally, financially, psychologically. Um, and I've seen that writers like you uh, are able to bind together people who need this right at this moment. So Alison Bork, with your new book, I'm going to read it so I get it right. Ali and the Cattywampus Wednesday. Highly recommended book, not only for Louisiana kids um, and not only for cat lovers, um, mm -hmm. but it's been great talking to you. Wish you lots of luck and have a... Uh, Caddy Wampa Day. And you too. Caddy <laughs> Wampa Thursday. And yes. as, many, as many desserts as you want. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Allison Bork, thank you very, very much. This is Mel Rosenberg from the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck, Allison. Thanks.